You think the instruments in an airplane are complicated? Well, maybe in an airliner, but definitely not in a glider. Things only start to get complicated when we begin programming the flight computers, but let's not worry about that for now. So, where do we start? Right, with the airspeed indicator. The airspeed indicator shows the speed of our aircraft relative to the surrounding air, in kilometers per hour or knots, not the speed over the ground. And that's a good thing because the dynamic airflow around the wings depends only on that airspeed. Ground speed can be totally different depending on whether you've got a headwind or a tailwind. Knowing how fast you're flying is essential for staying within safe operating limits and avoiding a stall. Of course, there are countless versions of this instrument, but most often it's a round dial type. Because the range of usable speeds is relatively large, the scale is often doubled. For example, on the outer scale, from 40 to 80 kilometers per hour, and on the inner scale, from 200 to 300 kilometers per hour. The display has several important markings you should know. First, the green arc. This is the normal operating speed range. Within this range, you can use full control deflections safely. Then there's the yellow arc. Here, you're flying fast enough that abrupt control inputs or using full deflection could cause structural damage to the aircraft. This only applies in smooth air. In turbulence, you should stay well below this range. The aircraft operating manual tells you exactly what's allowed and what isn't. Next is a thin red line. This marks the VNE, or velocity never exceed. This is basically enterprise speed, warp 10. Go beyond this, and the aircraft starts to tear itself apart. At the lower end of the scale, there's often a small yellow triangle. This indicates the minimum recommended approach, speed for landing. But be careful. This also only applies in calm air. Your instructor will explain why a higher speed is often used in real world conditions. So, how does the instrument actually measure speed? Through dynamic pressure, the airspeed indicator is connected to both the pitot tube, which measures total pressure, and the static pressure system. The air inside the airspeed indicator's housing comes from the static system and provides the reference pressure for an expandable membrane. The air that flows into the pitot tube during flight enters the inside of the membrane, which expands more as the dynamic pressure increases. This expansion is transferred via a mechanical linkage to the needle of the airspeed indicator, which then shows the aircraft's airspeed. What happens if the pitot tube gets blocked? Yes, that can be a problem. In fact, it has led to aircraft accidents before. However, it's the pilot's responsibility before every flight to check that the tubes are not obstructed. As a precaution, the pitot openings are covered after flights with a plug marked Remove Before Flight so that insects or debris can't get in and block the system. And what about air density? Does it affect the measurement? Yes, it does. For every 1,000 meters of altitude, the instrument underreads by about 6%. So at 6,000 meters, the airspeed indicator could show way too little at a true speed of 200 kilometers per hour. This brings us to the fact that there are different types of airspeed. Indicated airspeed, IAS, what the instrument shows, true airspeed, TAS, the actual speed through the air, corrected for measurement errors, and air density, ground speed, the speed at which you're moving over the ground. Watch this video snippet here. The pilot uses the airspeed indicator to maintain and landing approach speed 
of roughly 120 km per hour with a touchdown at 70 km per hour. Without instrument, this would be hard to achieve. The altimeter shows us how high we're flying, depending on the instrument, either in feet or meters. In European gliders, it's usually meters. This information is not only important for navigation and for complying with minimum altitudes and airspace restrictions, but also for the safe operation of the aircraft. In gliding, it's especially important to know at what altitude should I begin my landing approach? Or, in other words, can I still make it back home from here? The scale can be a bit unusual, but it's accurate. And at first, it might be a little confusing because the needles move similarly to a clock. The short, thick needle shows thousands of meters. The long, thin needle shows hundreds. So, for example, 1,500 meters would look like this. The altimeter measures changes in air pressure with increasing altitude. It uses the so-called static pressure system. In other words, a pressure port on the aircraft's exterior that senses the surrounding static air pressure. Inside the altimeter is a sealed airless capsule, also known as an aneroid capsule. This capsule changes its shape depending on the surrounding pressure. It expands or contracts. This mechanical movement is transferred via a delicate mechanism to a needle, which then indicates the altitude. The higher we fly, the lower the outside pressure, and the more the capsule expands. So how accurate is the altimeter really? The altimeter assumes that air pressure decreases with altitude in a standardized way, according to the International Standard Atmosphere, ISA. This works quite well, at least as long as the weather cooperates. The accuracy depends on how much the actual air pressure deviates from the standard atmosphere. If there's a particularly high or low pressure system, the altimeter can display an error of several hundred meters if the reference pressure hasn't been set correctly. That's why it's so important to set the correct pressure value before the flight. Otherwise, you might be flying 100 meters lower than you think. And that can be a serious issue, especially in airspace, with minimum altitude requirements. Even during flight, air pressure can change and lead to incorrect readings. A change of just one hectopascal causes a reading error of about eight meters or 30 feet. You can, of course, request the current standard pressure via radio and adjust accordingly, though this is mainly relevant for longer cross-country flights. Although the instrument is called an altimeter, it doesn't always show the same type of altitude. As mentioned earlier, that depends on the reference pressure you've set. You can see that reference in the small window usually with a knob next to it. Adjusting it changes both linked scales, air pressure and altitude. If you're just doing short local flights, you usually set the altimeter to zero on the ground, meaning the field elevation, known as QFE. The matching pressure appears in the small window automatically. So, when the altimeter shows zero, you're on the ground. But if you're flying further away, you'll set QNH, which means the absolute altitude above sea level that you're currently at, usually the elevation of the departure airfield. That way, if you land at another airport or need to interpret aviation charts during the flight, you won't have to do any tricky mental conversions. All values on the chart refer to absolute altitudes, meaning always relative to sea level. Every airfield and obstacle has its own fixed elevation.
If the altimeter shows the airport elevation, you're on the ground. If it showed zero, that would mean you're at sea level. There's also a third setting, QNE, which refers to the standard pressure of 1013.25 hectopascals. This gives you your flight level, important in higher airspace. The variometer indicates the vertical climb or descent rate in meters per second or feet per second of the glider relative to the surrounding air. For easier visual interpretation, the needle is arranged to point upward when climbing and downward when descending. Additionally, a sound can be activated. This is the typical beeping in different pitches, a deeper, continuous tone as the glider descends and a progressively higher pitched, rapid beeping when climbing. This allows the pilot to determine whether they're climbing or sinking without looking at the instrument. In straight and level flight, this instrument may not seem very important, but it becomes almost indispensable when circling in rising air. The variometer measures the pressure difference between the current static pressure and a reference pressure in a compensation chamber. A baffle plate reduces the airflow between the actual pressure and the reference. The pressure difference is indicated by a needle. If there is no further change in altitude, and thus in static pressure, after a few seconds, the reference pressure equalizes with the actual pressure as air flows through the equalization port into the compensation chamber. However, there is a problem. If we pull on the control stick, the variometer would indicate a climb, which is partly correct, but we are only interested in true rates of ascent, not those caused by pilot-induced control inputs. To address this, compensated variometers are used which are connected to a so-called TEK nozzle, a total energy compensation nozzle. This small probe is mounted in undisturbed airflow, often ahead of the tail fin, connected to the variometer. When airspeed decreases in a climb, suction from the probe decreases and offsets the pressure. In a descent, increasing airspeed increases suction you're left with an indication of the movement of the air mass around you. And that's it, what we want. Today, modern instruments typically use electronic compensation to achieve the same effect. Of course, there are hundreds of variations in display types. The explanations provided here cover the basic principles every pilot should know. There are still more instruments and equipment to discuss, such as the compass, the G-force indicator, the ELT, the radio, the transponder, the flam, and, most importantly, the yaw string. Stay tuned to this YouTube channel for the next video covering these instruments.